Have you ever been asked a question that kept you up all night? It happened to me a while back. I was pregnant with my little baby girl at the time, and while I was having a coffee with a friend, he asked me, what kind of city would you like your daughter to grow up in? Nothing. Blank. Over the past 10 years, I made it my career to make our cities more sustainable. I worked on everything from zero carbon emission buildings to full green neighborhoods. And yet, then and there in that coffee shop, I realized I had never thought about it like that. I just couldn't describe what my dream neighborhood would look like. It seems like such an easy question though, doesn't it? Could you describe your dream neighborhood? If I would ask you to close your eyes for a, sec for a second, could you bring it to life? You know what? Let's just give it a shot, okay? Bear with me here for a second. I would like to ask you to close your eyes for a minute. Take a deep breath in and a deep breath out. Imagine that you're walking down the street in your dream neighborhood. The sky is blue, sun shining, you can feel its warmth on your face. Take a good look around you. Who do you see in the street with you? Do you see any cars or any bicycles? Are there kids playing? And what do the buildings and the landscape look like? And when you listen very closely, what sounds do you hear? As you're walking about, taking in this amazing neighborhood, how does it make you feel? Okay, you can open your eyes again. Thanks for participating. Did anything surprise you, or did it look exactly like where you're living right now? As I was imagining my dream neighborhood, let me see. it kind of looked something like this, I guess. I quickly realized that more than anything, I want my daughter to grow up as a happy and a healthy free-range kid. Free-range kid? It's kind of like a free-range chicken, you know? And um, it means that I want her to be able to play outdoors and have adventures with the other kids in the neighborhood without me hovering around her the whole time. I want her to grow up in a place with lots of green space she can play in, with no cars or air pollution, a place where we actually know our neighbors and we have the time and the space to meet them and connect with them so they're not complete strangers. Unfortunately, that is definitely not the neighborhood I live in right now. Oh, sorry. Okay, never mind. Um, so I wanted to understand a little bit better um, how can a city make us happier and healthier? How is a city impacting our well-being today? And what would actually need to happen before healthy can meet city? If you know that over 70% of what impacts our health and well-being is linked to the environment we live in, you quickly realize that the smartest way to improve our health is by creating a healthier environment. Um, our health and well-being is a very complex interaction of our body, our behavior, and the environment we live in. I can go for a run every Sunday in the very lush and green ravines of Toronto. However, if I also choose to smoke, then that Sunday workout will never have the positive impact I'm looking for. So my environment can create a great platform for improving my well-being, but if my behavior isn't following, I'll never reach my goal. And it also works the other way around. Sometimes our environment is simply preventing us from carrying out our healthy intentions. Just think about how few of us in North America actually have the simple luxury of walking from place to place in our community. And the link between walking and the city and our health and well-being is a pretty straightforward one, right? Physical activity. It's usually one of the first things that come to mind when we talk about a healthy city. But the impact of the city on our well-being runs so much deeper. It occurs in ways we don't really think about. So today I want to share two examples with you that illustrate just how far it can go. 
but also how people have found really creative ways to turn things around and create their own healthy city. The first example I want to share with you is what we could call the suburbia syndrome. For decades now, we've built our suburbs according to the same model. Every house, it's preferably own fenced garden, one or two garages, broad streets for easy driving. The gym, the supermarket, and any other amenities are usually located at a mall, which is quite often a few miles away and only reachable by car. And most jobs require a considerable commute. I mean, we all know this model, right? So many of us live in it. And although today we still promote it as that happy community that is the best place to raise our children, more and more research is showing the price we pay for these car-based neighborhoods. Not only are we 35% more likely to become obese or overweight if we live in the suburbs, we are also less likely to know our neighbors, trust them, and feel socially engaged in our community. Only 16% of suburban residents say that they feel connected to the community they live in. And only 50% says that they feel like they can trust their neighbors. This can lead to a feeling of social isolation, which has a huge impact on our well-being. I know these numbers might feel a little a little strange, perhaps, because it doesn't always stroke with the idea we have of the typical suburban neighborhood. Until we start looking at how that environment is dictating our everyday life. In the morning, a family gets into one or two cars and drives to school and then to work. While driving, there is no opportunity to meet the other neighbors randomly and just have a chat apart perhaps from a quick, hi, good morning, to your next door neighbor, if they happen to leave at the same time. After work, same routine. Everyone gets into their car alone and drives home. Again, no opportunity for interaction. And something similar happens to the kids. After school, they're often confined to the backyard for playing, because the streets aren't perceived as safe, because of car traffic or stranger danger or both. But that means that they have very little opportunity to actually play freely outdoors with the other kids in the neighborhood, which is crucial for their development. But we'll come back to that in a minute. And the same thing goes for teenagers. And you guys all know about this. Teenagers thrive on social connection, and they need a place to hang out. But quite often in the suburbs, the only place you can go is the mall. But you need a car to get there. So that leaves very little alternative for teenagers to actually be outdoors, be active, and engage with the other teenagers in the neighborhood. So every time, it comes down to the same thing. Our suburbs lack different small-scale public places where we can all randomly meet each other, chat, where we can meet up and play or just hang out. And although it might seem like a small thing, it's not because it is eating away at our overall well-being. I came across a really interesting example of how people have turned this around in one of my favorite books. In his book, Happy City, Charles Montgomery describes the story of a neighborhood in Portland, Oregon, where the neighbors have found a really creative and a cheap way to solve this problem. It all started with one guy, Mark Lakeman who was sincerely unhappy with his neighborhood, for many of the same reasons we just talked about. For years, he looked all over the globe to understand how things could be, be could be better, looking for examples of people that have done a better job. Finally, he gathered his insights, and he did the simplest thing. He built a tea house in his front yard around a tree for all his neighbors. Slowly, slowly, people started to show up and chat with each other. Finally, they had a place where they could actually meet up. And more and more people started to show up, and tea turned into potluck dinners. And as the neighbors started chatting and shared their concerns about their neighborhood, an idea surfaced. The community decided that they needed a town square. But the streets were just not designed for it at all. So one day, 
the neighbors gathered at the intersection in front of the tea house. And they painted the whole thing. They put planters in strategic places to slow down car traffic, and they turned it into a joyful and a colorful gathering place for everyone in the neighborhood. And every time I see this picture, it just looks like so much fun. Like, I just want to like, dive in and join the party. And although city council did everything they could to stop them, because they were intervening in the public realm without permission, every spring, the neighbors would gather again and freshly paint the intersection. In fact, the experiment worked so well that it sparked a whole new movement called city repair. Neighborhoods all over North America are painting their own town squares and public places where they can gather and connect with each other. And some examples are just like, gorgeous, as you can see. In a survey done on one of these repaired neighborhoods, the people reported that they felt safer, they felt a sense of belonging now that they knew and they interacted with their neighbors. They felt less anxious, and their kids, actually, their kids actually got to know each other and started playing outside in the street. Their overall well-being had significantly improved, which is a huge win for an initiative that only cost $65 to paint that first square. This example of the city repair movement illustrates how we can find creative ways to build a healthy city. It illustrates that it doesn't always require large infrastructural works. Once we understand what we need, there's a lot we can achieve within our own communities. As I read about how those kids in that Portland neighborhood were playing outside in the street, my thoughts turned to my daughter again. I really want this for her too. And not just because I remember how much fun I had growing up and playing with the neighborhood kids, going on adventures, but also because I understand now that if she doesn't, the health implications can be quite enormous. The research shows that if our children don't get at least one hour of free outdoor play a day, they have a much higher chance of diabetes and obesity. And that seems pretty straightforward, right? Again, physical activity. But did you know that it also leads to lower intellectual and emotional skills, increased incidence of anxiety, and lower social development? When we walk or cycle to school in the morning, we have an increased concentration level that lasts up to four hours. That's pretty handy when you have to take that test, no? And it also works for walking or cycling to work, by the way. Same principle. So just imagine the advantage and the benefits for your health and for the environment if you could walk or cycle to work, uh, to school every day. Unfortunately, in North America, it is estimated that only 13% of children actually walk to school in the morning. And on average, kids get about, hold it, four to seven minutes of free outdoor play a day. Four to seven minutes, that's literally nothing. Just think about the consequences on their development and their well-being. So I hope you can start to understand why I really, really want my daughter to grow up as a free-range kid. So how can we make this happen? In Portland, they painted the streets, but there are many other ways we can create space for children. More often than not, it's about looking at what's already there through a different lens. When the city of Utrecht in the Netherlands asked our spatial strategy firm to look at the health and well-being of their city, we came across a different solution. We noticed that one of the neighborhoods really lacked a place for the kids to, to play. They just didn't really have a place to go. But, but we wanted to avoid the obvious solution of building a new playground as that would involve planning and budgeting and construction works, and, and it can be a really long process. So we wanted to find a solution for the children who were living there today, not in five years or ten years. When you think about what kids need to have a great time outdoors, not surprisingly, it's not a lot. 
They need lots of room to run around, obstacles to hide behind or climb on, and preferably a place that is free of car traffic. So looking at that neighborhood again, through this lens, with this new set of requirements, we noticed that there were two schools who checked all the boxes. Only their playgrounds weren't available for the neighborhood kids. So our solution was a simple one. Propose to the city and the school to come to an agreement to keep the schoolyards open after hours. In fact, the city got so excited about this solution that they turned it into a citywide strategy for all schools. Just imagine how many more outdoor adventures can take place now in the city of Utrecht by looking at what was already there through that health and well-being lens. I want you to think back for a second to that dream neighborhood that you visualized in the beginning. What it looked like and how it made you feel. How amazing would it be if you could start building that yourself, step by step, we all have the power to turn our cities into healthier cities. We just need to keep two key things in mind. First of all, that triangle is crucial. It's crucial because we need to understand how is our environment dictating our behavior. If we want to build a healthier city, we need to ask ourselves, what is the behavior that we're aiming for here? And how would our environment have to change to enable or support that behavior? Those are the key questions. Oh. And secondly, it doesn't have to be big. In Portland, they painted the streets. In Utrecht, they kept the schoolyards open. Whatever solution you might come up with, it doesn't have to be big to have a positive impact. So tonight, on your way home, or maybe tomorrow or the day after, I would like to invite all of you to really observe your neighborhood. What would you like to change? And how could you start changing it? Thank you. <laughs>